Hello and welcome to the Digital Culture Speaker Series. Today with us we have Garth Payne, our very own Dr. Garth Payne. Thank you for joining us today. Garth is a sorry. Garth is a composer, performer, and scholar. He was awarded a, a Green Room Award for Outstanding Creativity for Escape Philosophy Company in Space, and was a finalist for the Best New Musical Score for Dance in Australia. 2014. In 2018, Garth was researcher artist in residence at Here Comes It that time, developing Future Perfect for spatial audio, cell phones, and VR. He has an ongoing research position at Here Comes as well. He presented the keynote at 9 2016 and a keynote at 2014 Eco Musicology Conference on listening to space. Dr. Payne is a professor of digital sound and interactive media here at Arizona State University and co directs the Acoustic Ecology Lab. His music is performed internationally. His new work, Fracture, for Symphony Orchestra and the Audience's Cell Phones, will be premiered by the ASC Symphony on November 20th, 2021. So today, he's going to be teaching us about the future being spatial listening. So with that, please, Garth, take it away. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. So it's um, delightful to be here today to talk about spatial audio. and um, the, my interest, as I said in the little abstract of this talk, which is that the future is special. And, um, and we can look at that and think about the technologies that are coming out at the moment, uh, a plethora of them, um, not least of which is that. Oh, sorry, Thank my, so my crash. Everybody else hear me? Um, okay, so then the. Um, the, oh, sorry, Zoom has done something weird. Oh, you can say later. I could if I could find a mouse. Uh, may I? Yeah. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> okay, there. Don't touch it. Sorry about that. All right. So, um, so, for instance, recently we've seen Apple uh, introduce uh, Dolby Atmos as their surround format, which they're going to deploy across everything. Um, in my view, that's a very restrictive process, but nevertheless, it's a good step forward. Um, we've got so many other options coming out of Google at the moment. We've got um, extraordinary integration with VR. We have, you know, so much going on that I want to talk about some of those technologies and also introduce you to the dome over here, which we need a proper name for. Um, it was suggested to me we could call it Domey Dome Face. I'm not sure about that, but we could vote on that later maybe. Um, anyway, which is a fifth order ambisonic dome uh, for the reproduction of full uh, three-dimensional audio. Um, I realize that I have to stay here so that people online can see me. <laughs> um, and so at the end of my talk today, um, I've set that up so we can run some demos and play stuff and we can hang out there as long as we want to talk about that and experience that. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, now, one of the next joys is that my slides won't go. Okay, yeah. And so there has actually been, um, you know, research in this area for, for actually much longer than you would imagine. And of course, we need a lot of research in this space to work out how we perceive sound, where sources are coming from, how we make them come from certain points, et cetera. And here you can see where um, research is starting to look at the use of um, spatial audio in the room here um, through a high order ambisonic dome, a small one, um, which is providing the whole context for the experience that's happening through the loudspeakers. Now, this is already a really important step because as you know, uh, when you're listening to music through loudspeakers, it actually connects with your body. You have a kind of embodied experience of being present within that sound field, right? So this is quite a different experience, for instance, to sitting there in VR with headphones on. And so you can see here uh, research going on uh, actually in Paris where they're looking at uh, localization in VR and they're using a gaming system whereby uh, you shoot at things when they pop out and then they look at the correlation between where you looked and where the sound was actually coming from and so on in order to try to work out how well we're correlating three-dimensional 
uh, audit, auditory localization. Um, so I just want you to close your eyes for a second. And I'd like you to see if you can hear something behind you. And maybe off to your left. Maybe to your right. What about above you? Or in front of you? Okay, so you can open your eyes. And, um, and what that just helps reground you to think about is that you're using the spatial audio awareness that you have all the time in your everyday life. And you might say, oh, I didn't really hear much. It's pretty quiet in here today. But actually you heard the size of the room, right? You could hear the scale of the space you're sitting in. It's not a small room. You could hear some of the infrastructure working. You could hear people outside the door. You, kind of, you knew roughly where they were, et cetera, et cetera. We forget as we get like so heavily engaged in developing technologies for visual production, for instance, that we're using our auditory domain 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, even when we're sleeping, in order to be aware of the nature of the environment around us. Right? That's super critical. So then we can start modeling these things in three dimensions. And, and in order to do that, one of the things about an analog space that you're inhabiting at the moment is that sound can come from an infinite number of places and we can have an infinite number of reverberation patterns and so on. We need to start thinking about how do we model these things? How do we do that efficiently, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so here you see uh, SPAT revolution, which we'll look at later in association with the dome, starting to model speaker locations for spatial audit resources. And you can see here little colored objects, which are actual auditory sources within that three-dimensional space. Now, all of you will already, I'm getting just a little bit of background for students who are not familiar in this space, already be aware of stereo recording, stereo production, the pan pot left and right, et cetera, is to try to think about how we make an auditory field and how we do that very efficiently. Um, and this is based on basically phase and amplitude um, between signals that come from different locations across a stereo field, which is a frontal point of view. It's in front of you, right? And you can see over here, um, you know, a mixing kind of map of thinking about, okay, this is the center and we put our, our vocals there and so on. And then how we might spread out some of those sound sources in order to synthesize. So we're making a synthesized, a kind of false image, which we, which is a stereo image in which we feel like suddenly there's some space. So what's critical about that is not that things are on left or right, but that now you start to become sense, you, sense aware of there being space, of there being interrelationships about musicians actually being at places in the space that's now in front of you, right? And you can see the way that we might draw out the energy associated with that here um, in, a, in a spectrogram. So there are lots of techniques. This is been around now a very long time. Uh, those of you who are into music will be aware of lots of these microphone techniques from XY to coincident pair to ORTF and so on. And um, one that I think is even more interesting up there, the, the um, blue and red one uh, referred to often as MS or mid side, um, uses a single cardioid microphone to capture the center section of the image and then a figure eight microphone to capture the sides. This is used a lot in film. And you can see here already within the very basic math that's put there that on one side of that stereo image, you have M plus S, the side, and on the other side, you have M minus S in order to generate this kind of phase and amplitude difference that gives us a um, stereo signal. And what's beautiful about this is the amount, essentially the amount of figure eight 
uh, signal that you have in there allows you to widen or narrow the perceived field. So in a film where you're going through a door and suddenly the kind of acoustic space needs to narrow down, you can do that quite easily using an MS technique. Um, and then what you see over there on the far right is our good friend, the Neumann KU100, a very famous binaural head. And so this is a head with fabricated ears, little microphones on the pin ears inside the ear, um, $10,000 of absolutely beautiful sound. Um, and, you know, used all over the place. Um, so now we're talking about binaural, bi, to, oral, sound. And of course, now we're starting to think about the ears, the process of reception. And what our Neumann friend here tells us is that it's quite interesting to think about replicating the ears as a capture process as a microphone, right? The other great thing, of course, about having a Neumann head is that he can ride motorcycles, go to the beach, uh, become a crash test dummy, hang out in the band, you know, actually get the jokes from the drummer and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, good stuff. All right, so binaural then is um, for us in terms of VR, and for those of you who are listening over headphones, the basic and most used technique for developing a spatial awareness of where something is. And it's basically using the, exactly the technique that we're using with our ears to give us a sense of location. And all of this is really about how we locate sounds and how we get a sense of the environment around us. Um, and it's really big business right now. And I'm gonna go into why that is, but I'm just gonna play you a little bit of audio, a little bit of film, um, talking a little bit about and demonstrating binaural so that you can get a perception of just the difference between a mono or standard recorded signal, say in, in a film like this, or the actual spatial awareness mm -hmm. of binaural. Um, you're supposed to wear headphones for this. Those of you who are on Zoom, put your headphones on. Mm -hmm. uh, those of you who are in here will get a good sense of it anyway. Okay, you should wear headphones for this. It's gonna be pretty cool. I mean, it'll be cool without one, but trust me, it'll be a lot more comfortable. All right, so binaural audio. Um, and so this is like a, a microphone that's got two ears, right? The head, or in this case, no head, just the ears. Um, and the basic um, effect that's happening here, if this is our head, is that you can see if the sound source is here, it's gonna reach this ear before it reaches this ear. And so the phase difference between these signals and the amplitude difference and in fact, the timbre difference, because this sound is going to hit your head, which is going to absorb some of the frequencies, 
causes the signals on the two ears to be different. And our brain being like so extraordinary, uses that information to calculate where in the three dimensional space around us, the signal is, right? And so here you can see all kinds of research about sound pressure levels coming from different locations and how those uh, diffuse through different media and so on and so forth. This is a really, really big area. Now for this to work really well through headphones or if you're playing audio back, you actually need a set of filters that do all of what's happening in the air here for you. Because when you're listening on headphones, this source is not out there in the real world, right? It's just in a virtual recorded space. And so you need a set of filters that are going to tell the signal that comes in here how your ears respond. This is called an HRTF or a head related transfer function. And at, the, at this time, it's still something that's not easy to get to get, right? So this is me in Bell Labs in France, lined up with laser pointers, et cetera, et cetera. You can't see, but my head is actually locked in. I actually have like a steel thing around my head locking me in. I have like several motion capture dots above me so they can um, adjust for micro millimeter movements if I do move in the hour that I'm locked in there. And they're about to play signal through these loudspeakers that are going up here, again, over this side, under the floor and so on, little pulses that are going to go up and around. And at the same time, they're going to rotate me on a revolving chair extremely, extremely slowly to measure. I have microphones actually in my ears here to measure what's going on in my ears when they, they know the signal that they're sending there, right? So this is a complex and extremely um, computationally heavy mathematical process. And this is the smallest set of filters that I got that only has 455,361 lines in it. So it's big, it's difficult, right? This has been a hard thing to do, hard to set up as you can see here appropriately in order to get it accurate enough to make it worthwhile. And then a big set of numbers that you need to plug in somehow. However, this is absolutely critical to good localization in headphones. You could get like generalized localization in headphones, but you're not going to get good localization for you. And in VR that I've been doing for some years, some people put it on, we're using HRTFs in there, and some people with very narrow heads kind of feel the sound is up here, for instance, right? So it can make a really big difference. So this is a space in which there are now numerous startup companies, literally hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars um, going into this to try and see, can we just take photographs of your ear with your iPhone and then send that photograph back and do all kinds of um, calculations on the image and produce, um, oh, low battery, and, and produce an HRTF that's good enough to to substantially improve your spatial listening through headphones, right? So this is one space in which there's a huge amount of research and a huge amount of commercial interest. Sorry guys, there we go. Um, one example of that here where there's both hardware and software being built. And again, here to look at, um, you know, polar patterns and angles of reception and sound pressure levels and so on associated with where the sound is coming from and how it hits the pin ear, which is that little bit of extra bump in your ear and how that affects how you hear where things are coming from. Uh, sorry, my title's a bit covered up in Zoom. Um, so what that says underneath there is that actually, therefore, these recording techniques and these reproduction techniques are all psychoacoustics, right? This is really all black magic, it's trickery. Right? We're tricking you to believe that you're perceiving things that you perceive in the real world. Now, in reality, what you perceive in the real world is all trickery, but I don't have time for that talk today. Um, so, we're, so there's all kinds of stuff going on with phase and amplitude. And here, when we're having a stereo reproduction, you have two loudspeakers, you set those. And then as you can see here, if we have a source over here, um, then the time and the amplitude that relates, for instance, uh, to any of this graph here, the time along the bottom, 
uh, the level difference, just the amplitude difference uh, on the x-axis, um, shows us that we can use those two things to generate a kind of sense of localization about where that signal is. And so this is an amplitude variation. We might also use time and delay. And we, we, there are standard processes called, for instance, vector-based amplitude panning, VBAP, which is used very commonly, which uses this very technique to, to try and synthesize spatial awareness of, of sound. And we'll actually use that in the dome here. Now, notice down here that the difference that we're talking about in delay between these two channels is half a millisecond, all right? So the time resolution of all of these auditory functions is extremely short. And this is another reason why it's really difficult to get this right and also often computationally heavy. It has to be absolutely synchronous, but it has to be synchronous and allow for the differentiations that we're trying to set up here. Half a millisecond is, you know, something that's difficult to do regularly, like consistently, like without any jitter in your clock. <laughs> um, and so here you can see where this research is also then expanding out to think about, okay, what about concert halls? What about if you come to a concert? What about if you're like in the sound field, right? If the speakers are not just up the front there, what happens then? So that we're starting to think about actual physical spatial audio as much as we're thinking about spatial audio developed and produced for VR, AR, um, on your phone, et cetera, et cetera. So that brings us to a technique that we're using on the dome here, uh, which actually was invented in the 70s and has just exploded uh, this millennia, I guess, um, since 2000. Um, as people have come back to realize that ambisonics is really, really fantastic. Now, ambisonics is a way of both recording and reproducing a fully three-dimensional spatial signal. Um, it needs encoding. And what you can see up here at the very top um, is the zero order, which is the omnidirectional signal, um, which is everywhere like the full sphere, right? And then what you can see as you go down this triangle is that we're what's called adding orders to the ambisonic signal. And so in the first one, you see two bipoles pointing along the Y axis, two along the Z axis, two along the X axis, right? And so you can start thinking, okay, these are points of sensitivity to the audio signal. So now we have six nodes around on the horizontal plus the omnidirectional, and we can add all of those together. And we have what's called first order ambisonics, right? Now, you can do that with four channels of audio. Okay, that kind of makes sense now when you look at it, right? And then as we go up in the orders of ambisonics, um, we get much, much better spatial resolution. Now, you can see exactly why that is, because as you start to look at all of these on the all of these different axes, you can see that there are kind of like probes, if you like, or beams of sensitivity that are multiplying on each level. And we're adding all of these together. So it's not like we leave these away and we just come down here. So this is first order ambisonics, second order ambisonics, third order ambisonics, fourth order ambisonics, fifth order is not on here, but our dome is fifth order over here. And that would be 36 channels. Um, and you can see here then that all of these nodes start to look much more complex than a stereo signal because we're really creating kind of virtual microphones that are looking in lots and lots and lots of different directions, right? So this is the basis of ambisonics. Now, there are two other things that are really critical here. When we spoke about binaural and we had a little experience of listening to New York, you know, kind of binaurally over loudspeakers, you have to remember that binaural audio has a fixed perspective. So it's recorded with the ears there, listening out there, let's say, that's it. You can listen out there. You can't listen to what's going on behind you. So the point of view is fixed in the recording, okay? Okay, it's used the kind of modeling of your ears to generate some spatial awareness, but the point of view of that recording is fixed as it is with stereo and all of the other techniques that we've used previously. Secondly, there's no information in that recording about height. So when the bird flies overhead, 
you don't hear it above you, you just hear it kind of in the general plane in front of you somewhere, right? Now, what happens in ambisonics are two opposites of those things. Firstly, it's a format that provides you with information about height. That's why we have a dome, right? And we don't just have speakers around on the floor. And secondly, it has no fixed perspective. It is recording and reproducing a full 360 degree sphere of audio. And so you can turn around through that sphere in headphones or in the physical space and change your perspective in any way you like, right? Now that's when we're talking about 3D audio um, in, a, in a fixed infrastructure. And as I'll show you later on in say VR with, with advanced recording techniques, you can record a whole lot of ambisonic spatial 3D images and then walk through them and generate um, actually an embodied experience of where you can actually move through three-dimensional space getting a full three-dimensional audio field and video field at the same time. So ambisonics is what's called a channel-based system indicated up there. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but the other major area of research is what's called an object-based capture and reproduction system. Um, and places like Fraunhofer, for instance, have been really into this and it's built into the MPEG H format uh, that they use for the Olympic Games, although I'm sure none of you were listening on an ambisonic uh, playback. Um, and the difference being that here, uh, here, we understand where the loudspeakers are and we are modeling and diffusing the sound to those loudspeakers, which is what we're doing here, right? In this object-based system, each sound is an object and it carries with it a whole lot of metadata that tells it about the space, its location in the space and so on and so forth. So they're kind of really quite different approaches and I think they're going to gradually come closer together as, as we proceed. They're but you know, the object one is, is really very brand new. So this is all very wonderful, um, but you know, if you really need a dome that scale in your lounge room um, to listen to it and, um, and you can't get hold of anything to record, it's kind of like perhaps pointless to most of you. Well, there's lots of microphones that are also now available and come out. And we actually have several of these here in the school. Um, the Xylia one, which is there, that one. Uh, we also have the, um, the Rode NT1. Um, and one day, and I have a bunch of these other ones personally, um, which we can bring in and look at. And one day I hope to have an Eigen mic, um, which is a fifth order recording. So this means that with four microphones, like the examples you see on this side, you can record a first order ambisonic field, right? So you're recording a full three-dimensional sphere and you can bring it in and, and upscale it onto fifth order and play it in the dome here. So as we learned already, the challenge with that is that with only four nodes, we have limited spatial uh, resolution. We have some, but it's not like extremely fine, right? So then if we can increase the number of microphones we're using, this one being the, the new core mic, second order mic, um, and this one, the, the Xylia being third order, and this one, the Eigen mic being fifth order, then the more microphones that we have, preferably on a sphere, um, the more spatial resolution we're going to have in the recording. And this means, as you can hear, that we're going up, if we just go back here for a second, we're going up in ambisonic order in terms of the number of channels that are involved and the no number of nodes that are involved that give us higher and higher spatial resolution. So there's some of the funky things that we have here to play with. Um, what might surprise you is that uh, actually Amazonics was developed and commercialized in, in the 70s. <laughs> um, and that uh, Michael Gerson um, was, you know, really pioneered that. And here they are looking at a first order microphone, one of the first order microphones in 1976. Um, and they set up a company called Soundfield and the BBC used them quite widely. Um, they're also now used quite widely, for instance, in sports broadcasting, because as we're about to get to, ambisonics is what's called uh, format agnostic. So you can make a sphere recording and then you can reproduce that and play that back in any format you like. Stereo, 
5.1, 7.1, you know, um, Dolby Atmos, whatever you like. So it's actually really fantastic for contemporary TV broadcasts where they want to broadcast a stereo signal and a 5.1 signal simultaneously. They can derive both signals from a single microphone in the field and not have incredibly complex systems that they're trying to move around. Now, just to go back a step a little bit, which is that when we've got all of these channels, um, Ambisonics is capturing the full three-dimensional information. And it's able to do that and for us to store that and transfer that in an Ambisonic file, because the file, even though it just looks like a set of audio tracks, is actually encoded with a whole bunch of fancy math and it's, it's actually carrying a set of spherical harmonics or it is encoded using a set of spherical harmonics. So each order is another order of spherical harmonics that's associated with the encoding process, right? So it's absolutely critical when you're thinking about ambisonic audio to understand that it has to be encoded. And then we have a file that's ready for whatever we want to do it with it. Right? And then in order for us to listen to it again, it has to be decoded. Now, the beauty of this is because the, this process between capture and reproduction is, is, is broken, right? It's broken apart by a encoding and decoding process. It means that we can do all kinds of things in the middle here, right? There's a stereo recording, as a stereo recording here and it's reproduced as a stereo recording. And there's only so much you can do in the middle here. So what you can do with an ambisonic file is, is enormous. You can rotate the entire scene, tip it upside down, you know, put, put um, beam forming probes into just single parts of it to pick out voices, et cetera, et cetera. So the recording really becomes this spherical set of information that you can choose what you do with in post-production and in reproduction, right? Um, and here's just some examples of rotation of the whole image and so on, or here, um, putting a microphone into it. So the reason that I put that little animation is that essentially once we have this file and we want to listen to it, here we have 36 loudspeakers, in our decoding process, we're essentially putting 36 virtual microphones back into the sphere, right? and feeding the signal that comes to those virtual microphones to the loudspeaker in the sphere, right? And that's what allows us then to reproduce that back on this number of channels in, this, in, the, in, the, in the dome here. Now, there's a lot of debate, a lot of research still going on um, in ambisonics, that one of the things that's challenging here is localization. And I talked a little bit about higher order uh, ambisonics giving you better localization. Now, localization is really important, right? If somebody uh, hits a table here, if I do that, you can localize where that was really fast, right? And it, imagine that we're in a VR scene and somebody calls you from behind, you need to know where that is. Not like, oh, it's in that quadrant over there. You just want to be able to turn around and look directly at that person, okay? So one of the challenges that we still have and people are putting a lot of time and effort in here is how do we improve localization within ambisonics, which is, you know, an encoded, decoded kind of synthesized sound field. And we're not there yet. So I've been talking about recording and reproduction, but of course you could use it um, creatively. Right, And um, Tron has done a lot of work in ambisonics, um, built uh, the, you know, some of the early ambisonic tools for Max, for instance, uh, Max MSP. Um, and um, now I'm going to forget the name of that toolkit, but anyway, um, and is still working and doing amazing work in this space. And so here's a little experiment, a creative experiment, where he's basically asking, what if I put all of these sine tones on an ambisonic sphere and recreate them in, in a binaural for headphones, right? And then I move those sound sources around on the sphere so that I get different interferences between different frequencies in the spatial domain. And I'm just going to play you a little bit of this so you get the idea of that.
you're not going to hear so much of the kind of spatial awareness of movement here, but you'll hear this. So if you had loud uh, headphones on, you'd be you'd start to hear these things moving around you. But what you are hearing, which is super interesting, then is if you model these frequencies in different relations to each other, you get different interference tones between those frequencies, and you start to actually use space as a compositional element, right? So one of the things that really starts to open up here is that space itself becomes the material of auditory production and the material of creative process and so on and so forth. And these things were not available to us previously. Okay, so. Okay, so what I've been talking about up to this point in terms of ambisonics is a single capture point and single reproduction point, right? So you are at the point that the recording was produced if we're creating, or if it's a synthesized musical score, you're still at a point, which is within the three dimensional space, but it's a single point. And you can change your perspective and do all these things that you can't do in previous uh, formats, but nevertheless, you're in a single point, right? So, of course, the next question, and, the, and this research is only just starting, is to ask ourselves, well, what happens if we take lots of 3D capture points and then work out how to smoothly be able to move through those? Now, that's already a really complex problem because at every point that you're in, there's almost an infinite number of possible you know, reflections and perspectives and so on in that three-dimensional space. And so for every new location, you have to recalculate that. And for every turn of the head, you have to recalculate that. And then you start to recalculate that across multiple spatial signals. It's a, it's a complex problem, right? So to do that well. But nevertheless, we're starting to move into the space where you could walk through experiences, whether it's walking through the Amazon, whether it's walking through the orchestra or whatever, and actually take the, to be within the media experience and create a unique adventure or a unique pathway or a unique points of view within that experience. So it takes the kind of immersive media experience where all of this media is going as Robert's been doing so much work on recently too, um, is um, into the sense that it becomes a, everything, all media becomes an immersive experience and not an immersive experience from a fixed perspective, but an immersive experience that you can now inhabit in whatever way you choose to inhabit, right? Which is what we're doing in the, in the real world. Now, in addition to that, um, over the last couple of years, there's also been an explosion of tools for standard studio work flows, right? So Waves, one of the biggest plugin producers is putting out uh, the B360 toolkit, 
which allows you to take ambisonic recordings and work in ambisonics and then decode those and output those in all standard formats for film, television, and so on, um, including uh, Atmos. Now, of course, one of the challenges here is that we set up a bunch of tools like this, which output on standard formats. And these are, of course, all the formats that everybody's using now, which have all the problems I've already outlined. They have a fixed perspective, right? It's presented to you through a fixed perspective, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is already really old school, even though it's coming out now and making toolkits and workflows available, it's old school. It's really old school stuff. Um, Audio Ease have a really fantastic toolkit called the 360 Pan Suite. Um, go to Audio Ease, have a look at those videos, um, and I think it'll, it'll blow you away how you can really locate sounds within the space and, and move them to match up with the video and so on. So these are starting to be toolkits that are available for film production, where you're actually needing to locate sounds associated with an object in the three-dimensional space, right? And so you can really think not too many years down the track um, when it's highly likely that you'll be sitting in a fully immersive three-dimensional experience in a cinema and not just a screen at the front where there's a few loudspeakers to the side. Blue Ripple have been doing this for ages. I love the Blue Ripple toolkit and they're one of the first to produce really high quality integration for Unity. So we have full unity of all of these toolkits and these workflows, um, sorry, full integration already in the VR space and the AR space. Um, Unity uh, kind of woke, and Unreal woke up to this also in recent years and have started developing and putting out their own toolkits and APIs for this. So if you look at what's been happening over the last, you know, 20 plus years, you can see that this has actually slowly evolved from these early panning HRTF um, directional kind of ideas than Serio, um, then the creation of synthesized reverb to give you kind of spatial awareness. So oh, this is a big room, a small room and so on um, into much more sophisticated uh, tools that allow us to choose our own perspective to move around the space and so on. And this complexity, um, if I were to draw a curve of how this development has gone in the last five years was going along like this and then went like that. Like this is a super exciting time for any of you who are into this stuff to be working in the field. It's really super exciting. What's going on is amazing. And there are so many jobs in this space. Um, now this interests me, not only because I'm interested in designing experiences, which is how I think of myself as a composer, but also because I think I do think space is a principal material that we're working with when we're making good experiences. And so the work that I've been doing um, at EARCAM to develop uh, the toolkit for music performance and spatialization across all of the audience's cell phones um, plays into that same, you know, also looking at ways, new ways of putting sound out, having three 600 cell phones in an audience, being able to move it through the audience, bringing the sound directly to people and so on. Um, and in that, we also developed um, uh, some ability to track the movement of people's phones through virtual spaces and to change their visual and auditory perspectives based on, on their movement through those spaces. Um, so that's exciting work. Um, and I just want to remind all of those of you who are here, but on Zoom, um, that actually we have a workshop on the cell phone stuff, uh, August uh, 14, 15, uh, that will have Dr. or Professor Frederick Bevelark, we're here from EARCAM, we'll run a two day workshop on uh, that web audio cell phone toolkits that, that I'm involved in. And then I'll have a class where you get to compose and perform with those toolkits uh, after that. The other research that I've been doing here over the last couple of years, and I'm teaching again this semester, some of you I think are in that class, happy brackets, some of you have done it before, um, is to develop um, Raspberry Pi systems that you can program to produce music, uh, which sit on a network. So again, and this is true of all of these systems, you can have one device if you want, or you can have a thousand, it doesn't matter, right? It's fully extensible, the same code runs on any number of devices. But once you have like, you know, 30 Raspberry Pis hanging through the space, suddenly you have a kind of physical spatial energy, a body of sound that's suddenly in the space. And so... Just a simple uh, filter running across noise. 
Um, but these are all just sitting on a Wi-Fi network. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't matter. We can have thousands of them like this and use them for DJ sets where the music is um, being controlled and driven in real time by a DJ and where the audience is completely immersed within a full auditory visual environment. And so you can see that there are lots of ways of thinking about how media is becoming fully immersive and the presentation of things that we've taken for granted as a kind of frontal experience, a band plays up there with a big infrastructure and a big PA and it's all kind of, that's the institution and we're the audience, that these ideas are breaking down, that we're really trying to find ways of, of I think of it as democratizing that process where everybody's immersed in the process of creation and the experience that's being designed. And so there's lots of work going on in that space to model how we generate um, sound and how we steer sound. And here you can see it down the bottom, some with multiple loudspeakers and how once we start to think about ambisonics, we can have steerable, actual um, steerable, um, oh, what's the word I want? Um, rays, if you like, of, of sound within the space and so on. And so that brings me now as I wrap up and then we'll play some demos to what's over here, um, which is a project that um, Pavan has supported here at AME, the director, and uh, Peter and colleagues and I put up over the summer. Um, and it's, uh, as you can see, a dome that has a whole bunch of loudspeakers on it. Um, oh, go away, host. Oh, I got it. Um, and so I don't need to show you photographs of it because you're sitting here. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, of course, when you have lots of signals like this, you want to be able to feed them out without having hundreds of cables everywhere. Again, technology has evolved massively in this space over recent times. So Dante allows me to plug in a single ethernet cable and have like hundreds of channels running out of my laptop and patch them to any loudspeaker and so on and so forth. Um, then we're using SPAT Revolution to place all those loudspeakers in a virtual space, which allows us to um, simulate and to construct the spatial image within the dome, right? So this is actually the dome, the location of all of the loudspeakers. They're all mapped out over here based on azimuth, which is the angle around the dome, the elevation from the floor and the distance. Um, if you look at the last one of the last columns there, the distance is all the same. Hey, it's a dome. Um, but that means that we can now put um, signals into that space that can be any format, mono, stereo, large channel ambisonic files. And then we can actually um, uh, synthesize the way that that audio is correctly played across all of the loudspeakers. So we're decoding. Um, one of the beauties, as I said before, with ambisonics is then it's, agnost it's format agnostic. So I've got it set up for 36 channels in my dome. Um, but as you can see over here, for those of you into audio, you know, you could set, you could just play mono or you could choose any of the Dolby Atmos setups. And it just basically remodels the space and puts different loudspeakers in different places and then addresses the audio signal that's coming in and encodes it to go out in that format. So again, in terms of the future of audio production, ambisonics is really taking over because the same auditory file can be put out in lots of different formats and you don't have to go and re-record the whole thing. Uh, we're using Reaper here, but I won't go into that in detail um, to feed the signal to SPAT and then back out to the loudspeakers. And I kind of rushed through the last bit because I want to get to the demo, but I want to thank you very much for being here and for listening. And I'd like to invite some questions before we go to the demo. Thank you. Yes. Does anybody have any questions? I guess I can ask one. Um, actually, Without Except they won't hear you on Zoom. Oh, they can hear me just fine, right? Um, <laughs> the, the word vocalization is interesting, right? Yeah. Because uh, there's two components of this. Is one is your, your space actually generating the audio that reaches your mm -hmm. listener's ear. But then there's your listener, right? And how they're able to perceptually 
localize and listen for different things. Mm -hmm. So certainly there's some like training elements involved, right? Mm -hmm. Have your listeners understand mm -hmm. uh, your, the, 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 what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? How do you educate your listeners to be able to hear facial sounds uh, where you're placing them? Yeah, it's, I have kind of two probably opposing answers to that. One is you already do it, so I don't need to train you. You've been training since you were born, right? Um, you go out in the world and you understand where the car is <laughs> that's coming down the road. And so it's, it's already there. So then the question is, okay, so what happens in a physical analog world is we get all this reverberation, all these reflections, whether it's out on the street or whatever, and that gives us um, contextual information. And then we can hear amplitude and phase of the source, let's say it's a bus, and so we can um, add all that together and localize where it is in that context. Now, um, the analog world is, is infinitely complex in terms of the number of possibilities that are there. And of course, then we reduce that heavily in the digital domain. And so the question is, how do we optimize the potentials that we have in the digital domain in order to reproduce the experience that you already have? because we can't spend time training everybody. So therefore we need good HRTFs, which, which allow us to model your hearing in the real world, even though you have headphones on. And then we need to optimize the algorithms that we have in order to produce uh, more alignment in the phase and the timbral characteristics of the signals that we're localizing, which is you know what all of... Sorry, that is about, <laughs> yeah. Because what we're doing through the algorithms is kind of diffusing the energy at some level. And so therefore the source becomes less, pin, it's diff, more difficult to pinpoint essentially. We have other questions from the audience. Probably will have these microphones. <laughs> so this is interesting as always to listen to and think about. Um, I'm interested, and in, this is partly coming from the talk last week about the social dimensions of this, um, especially when this is when this is an interactive system and it's not just a static, just play, playing back something that's been pre-recorded. When it's dynamic, um, are we limited to a single person interacting with this space? It seems like that would be the case in a dome, for example. But and does that does it require require this to be individualized to to a headphone experience or something like that? So I think that depends entirely on what the the interaction or the relationships are that you set up. So it brings to mind immediately a piece that Norbert Schnell did with the phones, which was eighty eight notes, and every note was connected to a different note on a grand piano disc clavier, and then the community had to work out how to play the piano collectively, right? So you had 88 people playing one piano in that case, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that there's any limitation in terms of number of and types of input to drive transformation, but you would have to be clear about why you have the input and what the transformation is mm -hmm. producing that extends or augments the experience. Otherwise, there's to some extent no point. In so it's, so it's, it would be more about the compositional intent right. as, as opposed to... Right. To trying to reproduce just our everyday, you know, physical reality experience. Right. So partly what I've tried to point to in my talk, like with Tron's work, is that of, of course you can use it to reproduce and create uh, a sense of being places. And I'll play you uh, some of um, uh, the tenant ensemble performing Monteverdi's Vespers in a church in New York. Um, some of them on instruments that were performed under the baton of Monteverdi, like traditional instruments, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, what Tron was showing here and what I, I can also play is, is creative explorations. And so the point that I often try to make is that what this gives you is that we've had, you know, timbre and, and, and sound as material in our compositional sense. And now we have space as a compositional material. So what do we do with space as a compositional material is a whole different thing. Right. And so now I can put you in the experience. So it becomes an embodied experience. And so now we're really talking about completely different sets of relationships. 
So in terms of our interactive input, this would also then be completely different, right? Thanks, guys. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, I had a question about um, talking about space as an important, I guess, I don't want to say parameter, but an important component of the creative process in terms of composition. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the multi order ambisonics uh, and the analogy of sort of capturing more precise locations around um, someone in the middle of the dome, for example. But I'm wondering, is there any work, any research related to spatialization in terms of distance from the sound source? Like, can you make the sensation that something is like extremely close or miles away, hypothetically? Yeah, yeah, yeah you can, yes. I mean, and you can um, do beamforming even within an ambisonic signal and then bring that signal closer. Um, so the thing with the ambisonic file is it becomes this it just becomes this huge data set that you can basically do anything you can imagine within it um, so yeah you can do that the other thing i sh i didn't have time to say is that um, the other advantage of ambisonics is that you have quite a large sweet spot and the higher the order the larger the sweet spot and the higher the frequency the top frequency of the sweet spot is so with fifth order we've got about six kilohertz as the top frequency in our sweet spot and the sweet spot is big enough for about 30 people in the dome and so you know you get quite a different experience and when you, when when I fire it up which I'm sure you're just waiting for right now um, you will notice that you don't really hear a loudspeaker you just hear a sound field so the loudspeaker kind of disappears so there are lots of things actually about the experience of sound within this kind of technology that are quite different. All right, well, with that, let's go ahead and transition to the next phase. Let's. Thanks. Right. Let's give Garth another round of applause. Thank you again. Thanks for being here. All right. Sorry, Zoom people. You can't come to the Zoom. <laughs>